We got Genova. A locked reactor door. The name of Sephiroth's mother. And an ancient. Ah, screw it. Racking my brain's not gonna get me anywhere. May as well just ask the guy. Quickly before we begin, I'd like to give a huge thank you to fellow YouTuber and illustrator slash graphic designer Jazzy Okami. She was kind enough to help me finish graphic design elements for the channel that I'd been trying and failing to refine for years now. She's a phenomenal artist and also a fantastic video creator, and her channel definitely deserves more attention. She's got videos on topics like Rebirth, or Cloud as a Character, Zack, the multiverse stuff, drawing cloud, and much more. And everything I've watched is fun, concise, and well thought out. Link to her channel in the description. Anyway, on with the video. As I'm writing this, I've been sitting here silently for around 10 minutes now, headphones on and music pounding away. Cursor blinking at me without a single word put down on the page. I'm not someone who gets writer's block, i found systems and habits over the years to help prevent it, and those have been reinforced through doubling down on similar habits when it came to artist block. I'm not at a loss for what to say about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I've got 11 pages of notes waiting for me to dive into once I get this intro done. And I'm not disinterested in talking about the game either. I just don't know where to start. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth isn't perfect. No game is. And depending on your sensibilities, it might resonate with you, or it might not be for you much at all. There are elements that are kinda rough. There are also elements that hardly push meaningful boundaries. And while some people get way too caught up in using quote-unquote lack of innovation as some sort of cheap childish gotcha, I get it if you look at the open world elements and yawn. But it wasn't more than maybe 15 hours into the 188 plus hours I've spent in Rebirth thus far that I realized it was one of the greatest games I'd ever played. And while there are certainly elements that tried to topple those feelings, which we'll absolutely discuss, those feelings also continued to be reinforced against my most cynical sensibilities. As with Remake, I was nervous about this game. There were a lot of questions related to how they'd handle the world, some of the more important story elements, and the little bits of Final Fantasy VII that give it the unique flavor that holds it so firmly within the gaming consciousness. I've already seen a few people make takedown pieces of this game, and I've seen plenty of whining online. There are, of course, legitimate criticisms worth making here. Me saying that Rebirth is one of the greatest games I've ever played does not translate to me arguing it's one of the most well-made games ever released. But it also does a lot, absolutely phenomenally, that certain toxic theory-crafting grass-deficient groups would go to the ends of the earth to undermine, purely to to justify their seething hatred. The only way they seem to be able to cope is to burn the whole thing down to the ground. What I will remember the most about Rebirth as time continues to put distance between myself and its release are the little moments of thoughtful quirk that make it incredibly clear that people on this development team understand Final Fantasy VII on an intimate level, that they want to be working on this remake trilogy, and that when they're on point, they're damn good at their jobs. I can already point to how my brain is going to feel about this game in the future. I will never forget the first section you spend in Calm in Rebirth. The grand scale, beauty, granularity, and the effortlessness of its precision are now baked into my brain, and feel mostly emblematic of my experience with Rebirth at large. Those feelings of the first few hours of messing around in Calm are going to be the feelings I associate with Rebirth going forward, and I couldn't be happier about that. So I want that known up front. 
I absolutely loved Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I don't think I'll be able to do my feelings on it justice, but I'm still going to enjoy talking about it here anyway, flaws and all. If you're someone who didn't much like the game for one reason or another, that's okay, and if you stick around, I hope you end up finding something in this video that makes it worth watching for you. It's okay with me if people dislike the game, and I want those people to have their space to talk about why. I know that most people are going to be more rational and level-headed about it, because there are legitimately weak elements here, and there are things to dislike depending on who you are. So if you're cool and respectful about it, we're good, bruh. If you're someone who loathes the game on principle, though, because you're incapable of moving beyond the smell of the rancid ego that's stuck in your ass along with your head, if you're the type of person who is harassing creators like Maximilian Dude, and are dead set on ruining the experience for everyone else despite your own blatantly thoughtless shit takes, go fuck yourself. Nobody wants you here. Go rewatch your favorite takedown pieces and cry about your pathetic bitterness alone. These people know who they are, and if you're unsure if that's you, it's probably not. So again, we're cool, bruh. I've learned to do a lot better myself since my previous video ranting about the game, and I've accepted that Rebirth is just about power washing stuff and playing an Apex Legends knockoff, okay? No more needless hate from me. Complete spoilers for Remake, the Intermission DLC, Rebirth, and the original Final Fantasy VII ahead. Now, you might want me to jump into Rebirth right away, and we'll get to it as soon as possible, but I've never actually gotten the chance to look at Intermission or Intergrade, so why don't we do that really quickly. I promise I'll keep it quick, because there honestly isn't that much there that can't be said in the Rebirth segment. Intermission was the only story DLC for Final Fantasy VII Remake. It takes place during the first half-ish of the game and introduces Yuffie, some elements of the more legitimate branch of Avalanche, and a character named Sonon who is from Mutai, just like Yuffie. It also lets players experience both Yuffie's core mechanics and some of her abilities we'd see in Rebirth, and a couple of mechanical ideas that are spread between the cast in Rebirth. Beyond that, it introduces the Fort Condor minigame that is reportedly meant to replace the actual location of Fort Condor that supposedly doesn't exist in Remake, at least not in the form that it took in the original. Fort Condor is fun, but it can get pretty challenging unless you use some very exploitable strategies. It's a solid interpretation of the original minigame that's far more balanced and focused. I'm someone who doesn't have a problem with the original, but this variant is fine, and if you enjoy it, there's a fair amount of content here to sink into. Yuffie's combat mechanics are all about speed, elements, and balancing between up-close physical attacks and ranged magic. She can leave her shuriken spinning in enemies and cast spells at its location, which can be infused with any one of the four elements, and she can zoom over to it at any time to get in close and slice enemies up directly. Her dodge is arguably the best across remake and intermission, and she has a perfect block mechanic that makes her completely immune to damage if you time your block just right. This was then given to every character in Rebirth. Sonon, her Wutaian ally, can't be controlled directly, but he has his own abilities that are primarily designed around supporting Yuffie. He can take aggro pretty well, and with L2 he can team up with Yuffie to do joint abilities, though this massively slows down how quickly his ATB gauge fills up. These are absolutely significant enough changes to make this DLC feel fresh for its moderate runtime, and I enjoyed how thoughtfully balanced they were once again. For many, Yuffie is arguably the most powerful character in Rebirth, which is saying something considering how effective each of the others is, and this DLC was an excellent way to test her out and refine her through widespread feedback. The story of Intermission is pretty simple and contained. Yuffie comes to Midgar looking for Avalanche, and plans to steal some highly experimental materia from Shinra. Along the way, she gets into some shenanigans which culminate in her and Sonon going up against Scarlet, who then tries to take them down with Deep Crown soldiers and experiments. This means Nero and Weiss are here, with Nero serving as the final boss. I'm not someone who likes the story additions to Final Fantasy VII through the compilation projects. Geostigma from Advent Children is a good idea, but otherwise the story and character elements of Crisis Core and Dirge of Cerberus especially drive me up a wall. However, I was open to them being better integrated into Remake despite not really wanting to see them at all. Thankfully for me, Deep Ground, Weiss, and Nero are just kinda 
here for this contained story and to serve as VR super boss fodder. So I don't even have to think about their impact on the narrative since there isn't much of one as of now. In the end, Sonon dies, which forces Yuffie to grow up just a bit, with the DLC more or less ending as she watches the plate fall in Sector 7. It's nothing special, but nothing offensive or particularly distracting either, and mechanically, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Integrate as a whole is also a stellar upgrade to the original Final Fantasy VII Remake. Getting into the game from the PS5 OS is legitimately like 7 seconds of waiting, sometimes 6, because you can have it skip straight from the PS5 UI to the last point you saved. No main menu and no splash screens. Loading times as a whole are also lightning fast, and the 60 FPS, fixed texture issues, and option for native 4K locked to 30 FPS are great. Seriously, the loading times in particular have a knock-on effect with Rebirth as well. Being able to press resume activity and jump straight in, or fast travel wherever you please in just a couple of seconds is unreal, which is particularly great in such a vast open world. In Rebirth, the quality of the loading and infrastructure here is highlighted by just how slow the loading times between VR challenge battles can be in comparison. I have no clue what the issue is, but sometimes they can be like 7 to 10 seconds, which to be abundantly clear is still fine, just weird is all. Those glorious load times were my first good impression of Rebirth, and honestly, they just kept coming from there, so let's finally dive in head first, starting with the story. Didn't really notice at the time, but looking back, all the signs were there. From the moment we arrived, Sephiroth just wasn't himself. Despite the praise I gave Remake for understanding the world and the characters of Final Fantasy VII rather well, and the fact that I didn't mind most of their changes or additions because I understood the intent behind them, I was still worried about Rebirth just like many others. It's my go-to example, but Mass Effect back in the day really burned me. Not because I think the moment-to-moment -moment storytelling in Mass Effect 2 and 3 was bad, far from it, but instead I was bothered because it was a series that set up an imminent, fast-approaching, apocalyptic threat at the end of the first game. And then all of Mass Effect 2 and large parts of Mass Effect 3 dawdle and tell you to look at the shiny thing over in the corner of the room instead, hoping you won't notice that they're just kind of spinning their wheels on the primary threat the whole time. Mass Effect 2's storytelling doesn't really tie into the rest of the overarching narrative of the trilogy until right near the end, which for me was frustrating after being primed for something entirely different. The Witcher 3 has a similar issue that I criticized back when I looked at it. Witcher 3's moment-to-moment -moment writing is similarly fantastic, and it has astonishingly good characters, but I can't ignore the fact that the game gives you one objective spread across three quests not long after it begins, and then you spend the next 45 hours if you skip side content for the most part barely progressing that objective. You're just marking off leads toward your goal and learning bits and pieces of valuable info. And what's more, at the end of two of these three major objectives, the information you learn is fundamentally identical between them, meaning no real progress is found there. They have great narrative beats in a weak narrative structure. I was worried that Rebirth might have vaguely similar issues, because an open world is a great opportunity to waste the fuck out of the player's time. I only thought two bits of Remake were unnecessarily forced into the core experience. They were the second visit to the sewers and the stuff in Hojo's lab. I think they were both solid dungeons on their own, but they probably should have been optional. But there's very little here that's overextended if you were to go straight through the game. This is made abundantly clear when you go through hard mode, where every detour risks making finishing a chapter much harder, so you want to skip straight to the story elements, meaning even if you watched the cutscenes and did all of the story minigames, you'd be looking at maybe 25 hours of time. I get some of the complaints I've seen, like the Temple of the Ancients doubling back on itself and showing you what other characters were up to a few times, but it's also the final dungeon. And again, if you're going straight for the objective, which is always made fairly obvious, it's not actually that long. It took me about an hour on hard mode. I actually do feel like going through the Shinra Manor with Kate and friends is unnecessary as a mandatory excursion. Another one that should have been made optional, I'd say. And it's a bit of a shame that they didn't incorporate mansion puzzles like in the original game. Even Crisis Core does that. Though maybe that's something being saved for the third game. 
Lost Number is unfortunately not going to be there though, because you defeat him in this game, and for some reason his name is Forgotten Specimen, which I feel gives him less mystique. Anyway, despite a couple of bits like this, by and large I found the mandatory expansions tastefully fun and engaging to experience. This game is touching, it's smart, it's beautiful, it's heartwarming, it's heartbreaking, and a lot of the time it's funny as heck and heck. This is one of the most charming games I've experienced in ages. It doesn't start out that way, of course. The game more or less opens on the Nibelheim flashback, where Cloud tells the party about his most pivotal experience with Sephiroth. This bit is astonishingly well crafted, and interestingly, I don't think it'll get tedious on your 5th or 6th playthrough like it can in the original, because unlike the original game, Sephiroth is actually playable here with his own bespoke mechanics. That's an incredibly smart way to add a uniqueness to actually playing through the flashback that had to have taken mountains of work but was absolutely worth it. They could have easily made Sephiroth AI controlled, like they did with Red at the end of Remake, and I wouldn't have even blamed them, but getting to experience his mechanics here adds so much. And that goes for the narrative and characterization of this section as well. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate what they did with Sephiroth in Rebirth, particularly in this Nibelheim flashback. In the original, that flashback is short. He gets meaningful characterization, but he also unintentionally comes off as a bit arrogant and short with people at times. In Crisis Core, likewise, he's very shonen anime when he's around, or he's simply missing outright. And on the rare occasions where he is on screen, while he can be a bit thoughtful at times, he's primarily treated more like a disinterested enigma. Crisis Core's version feels like Sephiroth as written by someone who already knows that the audience knows how his story concludes, so he takes on a darker and more aggressive trait that he shouldn't actually have at that point. But here in Rebirth, he's so personable. He makes jokes, the inflection in his voice has a brightness to it, and a willingness to trust and respect others despite knowing he's leagues above them. He feels humble and willing to be a bit vulnerable and relatable. He's kind and smart and gentle in ways that feel very much in keeping with his backstory and his tragedy, very much in keeping with the idea that he is the genuine hero that everyone across the world knows the name of and remembers that arguably he is the reason that after all of the tragedy that Shinra has already caused leading up to the Nibelheim incident, people are still largely willing to trust that Shinra is good for the planet and humanity. He's a good poster boy. This is a Sephiroth that feels vulnerable in ways that justify him turning disgust on himself after he learns his origins, and feeling betrayed to the point of spiraling too deep to be recovered. This is a Sephiroth that cares and does not take his power for granted, but when you turn that on its head, now you've made a true monster who knows just how powerful he is, and he wants to use that power against everyone who takes part in the vile world that created him. This is a Sephiroth that really does make your heart ache when you realize he's gone, like losing a good friend. I also think adding more soldier-focused elements further elevates his story. In the original, Sephiroth kind of felt like a bad apple sort of situation. Especially when combined with the clumsy elements of Crisis Core, Sephiroth starts to feel further and further detached from the military force that literally spawned him into existence. Here, Soldier may be a shadow of its former self, but it still exists in a palpable way. It better illustrates both how far his sheer might, and the might of the others who have had the most experimentation done on them, has risen. But it also more seamlessly reminds us that Sephiroth was part of a system that was always designed to cause pain and destruction for anyone who resists. Shinra got unlucky when the strongest of them all betrayed the company and exploited his power to create unwanted devastation but it could have happened in so many other ways with so many other people in the soldier program. The apple was rotten because the system was designed to foster such putrid toxins. In this way, Sephiroth's sheer power, especially after falling into the life stream and gaining the knowledge of the Cetra, still individualizes him as a proper villainous threat, but his origins now better speak more clearly to the cruel nature of the systems that created him. If Soldier keeps going, if Shinra were ever able to recover enough to keep their experimentation alive, 
it's only a matter of time before a Roche or any one of the third or second class officers we see ends up just as destructive and unpredictable. And heck, that precarious balance is a large part of Cloud's story and his identity crisis. Zack is the mirror held up to Sephiroth, and Cloud is balanced in the middle, able to go either way. The creativity and breadth of this version of Gaia does a great job of reinforcing what's lost if Sephiroth or Shinra win as well. Every piece of the world has Shinra's dirty footprints and oily handprints all over it. The original game felt like a bit of a dystopia, where most people live in squalor in the couple of large cities that exist. Then the rest of the world is mostly just shanty towns and ghost town dregs of humanity that are barely maintaining their cobbled together existence. Rebirth is instead a world that's still alive, but on life support. They're not over the cliff, but they need to break now, or there's no stopping it. Rebirth more readily treats itself like a world that's currently falling victim to late-stage capitalist corporate greed, thanks to the general disinterest in course correction, and a want to maintain their current levels of comfort. This feels less like a world that's defeated already and needs a restart, and more like a world that's rapidly circling the drain due to the excesses everyone enjoys while they often ignore the travesties happening around them. They're shutting the world out to focus on just having that one last fun time in the gold saucer or whatever, while it lasts. Not wholly dystopic, but headed there fast, something I'm sure many of us can empathize with. That allows more of the vibrancy of the world to shine through especially with how expanded said world is. You not only want to save the people from annihilation here, but also the cultures, which largely only really extended to places like Wu Tai or Cosmo Canyon before, since the identity of nearly every other area was already turned to dust by Shinra. By letting up on the destruction just a little here, you can still feel the fact that Shinra has created an awful dependency on their power and used that leverage to crush all but the most marketable elements of these destinations, but it still allows the player to see the parts that are worth saving, which could be missing quite often in the original. Little felt salvageable in Nibelheim or Gungaga, under Junon, or Corel in the PS1 game, and places like Rocket Town, Wutai, Costa del Sol, Junon proper, Midgar, and the Gold Saucer were either turned entirely into highly controlled tourist destinations for Shinra's benefit, or were straight up Shinra installations. But in Rebirth, you can see just enough of the vibrant soul of most of these places to recognize a motivating beauty that increases in importance with each area visited. Just like in our world, there is a complexity to knowing that places like the Gold Saucer are temporary, as are most Mako-centric amenities people have grown to rely on, but at the same time, people are uncomfortably and quietly aware that ending that reliance kind of needs to be done, despite being unsure if there's an alternative that's more sustainable. Another thing I appreciate quite a bit is Aerith's speech in Cosmo Canyon. In the original, I felt like Aerith being a companion overshadowed the fact that she's the last Cetra by the time she finally dies. But I think small additions like this do a great job of helping us to remember, this is it. Aerith dying is the end of an entire race. She has the weight of that race on her shoulders, and while she ends up being a paragon of her people in the end, she's also the end of that entire lineage. It's the same in both games, but it's something she more actively explores in Rebirth, whereas in the original, a large amount of that was only done in direct response to Shinra's want to use her. That makes it extra chilling in Rebirth. There is a lot of quality writing in Rebirth. It's not perfect, and there are absolutely fumbles. Interestingly enough, the fumbles are often at the most important moments, but for me personally, Final Fantasy VII has always been a story about characters, and the charm of the character shines so brightly that the negative impact of the things that I take issue with pales in comparison to what succeeded for me. It would be too much to list all of the little moments that absolutely knocked it out of the park. Cloud and Tifa's argument early on, the countless jokes, moments where Cloud lets his guard down like after the loss of Dine, Barrett basically in his entirety, 
they even handled Kate Sith much better than before. If you've seen my critique of the original game, you might remember that I felt like Kate Sith had a good concept, but pretty terrible execution. He forces his way into the party in a way that makes no sense, but nobody asks questions. Immediately afterwards, if you stop by Gengaga, Cloud and company start getting suspicious that someone is relaying their movements to Shinra, and conclude that they probably have a spy in their ranks but they don't think to point the finger at the weird new guy who talks to them remotely through a robotic Shinra toy and who forced himself on them at Shinra's amusement park. Then, Kate Sith betrays the party in a truly despicable way in order to take the keystone from us, has a change of heart at the end of the Temple of the Ancients, and we're just supposed to act like he's redeemed? Even if you feel his actions warrant redemption in a vacuum as he proceeds to be crushed by the shrinking temple, he immediately comes back, completely undermining the sacrifice. If he literally had a backup body waiting two minutes down the road, that's not a sacrifice worth giving a shit about. It's not worth ignoring the fact that he kidnapped Elmira and Marlene. At best, that's an action worth a, hey, thanks bro, like when you and your buddies stop at the gas station and they unexpectedly buy you a soda. And in context of his choice to kidnap an innocent woman and a young girl to get what he wants, it's worth a, screw you, you stupid stuffed animal, and maybe a barrage of fire spells thrown his way. Here in Rebirth, Kate Sith gets a lot more time and is a lot less weird. He's more helpful, charismatic, and has a genuinely infectious personality. There is reason to trust him in Rebirth, unlike the original, because he makes plenty of choices that actively undermine Shinra motives. That being said, I'm still of two minds on his betrayal here. In Rebirth, Kate Sith actually gives the keystone to Shinra because he'd rather a bunch of Shinra assholes die in this temple that supposedly nobody ever escapes instead of the party, and he never partakes in the kidnapping of Elmira or Marlene. On the one hand, basically anything is better than the original. This is an improvement because it doesn't rely on isolating every decision the character makes from any logical suspicions or actions our party would realistically be making in response to him. And what's more, at the very least, Cloud doesn't completely forgive him, which could be used meaningfully later in Part 3. I think the developers realized that for a lot of people, kidnapping characters we care for would have crossed too big of a line. It certainly would have for me, because it does in the original. So instead, they had it be a fake out, which honestly makes it less impactful than the idealized version of the original that we have in our head, but it also makes more sense for the character controlling Kate Sith, Reeve. I find it hard to imagine that any version of Reeve we know would sit by complacently while a child and innocent woman are being held hostage and threatened in such a way. By the time FF7 starts, he's too disillusioned with Shinra for that. So, it's an improvement, but I also get it if people feel like it was the easy way out. I'm also into what they did with Red 13's character here. Sure, it's not the most subtle thing in the world, but the voice change once you get to Cosmo Canyon worked for me, especially since there are still moments where he moves back into the more serious voice, as if it's not entirely an act, but is simply a facet of him that he wore as a mask. Side characters are also largely pretty wonderful, thoughtful, or creative. They basically all fit their roles well. There's just so much to this game's writing that I find phenomenal, but a lot of it is the small things, which build up to a bigger whole, and I'm not really interested in spending the next hour just name dropping small little quips or jokes or character moments. I understand why even some of the great stuff won't land for certain people. We all have our own version of Final Fantasy VII in our heads, you know? That being said, I think the chipper comedic writing here is likely to be pretty universally loved. While playing, I couldn't help but notice that it really does make Kingdom Hearts 3 look so much worse in comparison. The game that was supposed to be the big budget, modern console, grand return of that series, and conclude the story arc that had been running for nearly 20 years at that point, had one truly whimsical, funny, and charming moment to call its own. One moment that wasn't stripped verbatim straight out of Disney movie scenes. Specifically, the moment where Sully throws Vanitas into the doorway in Monsters, Inc. Kingdom Hearts is a series that realistically should be predicated on charm and wit and optimistic comedy, especially to make the darker moments more meaningful, because it's a crossover with fucking Disney, and yet they haven't been able to capture a single drop of that charm or wit since Kingdom Hearts 2. But Rebirth? 
This is a game that's about a meteor being summoned to destroy the planet by a lab experiment super soldier and his planet eating pseudo mother. It's about a corporation that took over the world through force and is now bleeding the planet dry of its life juice. An employee of that company struggling to reconcile his work with that reality and a lab rat dog that is traumatized because he was being experimented on by that company. It's a game about a man who loses his home, his wife, his best friend, and his arm because of this company, and now can't even see his adopted daughter anymore. It's about a woman who lost her mother and a culture she never knew, and then outright dies for it at the end. It's about watching a man slowly, mentally erode into a chaotically violent mess, and the childhood friend whose only tie to her destroyed home is this eroding friend. This is the game that's literally overflowing with charm and wit and a genuine comedy that basically never feels out of place, thoughtless, or unnatural. This is one of the most charming, hilarious games I've ever played. It's to the point that while I was playing, every time I thought about the important story beats that were coming up, I couldn't help but giggle in delight at how it all might be handled. I think the reason Rebirth is being praised for its comedy, wit, and charm so much is because it isn't following the kitschy, generic norms most media today defaults to. This isn't a knockoff of generic, irony-filled MCU wit. It isn't snarky, cynical crime drama wit. It isn't shonen anime trope JRPG sludge wit. It feels truly, uniquely witty in ways that best suit the moments and the characters involved. It's refreshing, because it isn't trying to force itself into a subgenre of corporation-approved dialogue and joke setups and one-liners. It's diverse and focused instead of trying to be something more profitable. And importantly, when it's self-aware, it doesn't feel self-congratulatory or humble-braggy in that awareness. As I've already said though, there are things that I'm not the most fond of, and a lot of them are the big moments. To start smaller, the Midgard Zormer is one of the few places where I think the bigger nature of Rebirth shined through too brightly, and damages something that was otherwise designed to be subtle. I actually disagree with people who argue the game just won't let things be small or subtle. Instead, I think a better argument is that the game isn't always interested in recreating the type of bombast or subtlety that made a moment work originally, but the Midgard's armor is an exception. In the original, you have to ride a chocobo to cross the swamp and avoid being eated by the big snake. <laughs> or at least that's what the game intends. Sephiroth apparently just walks through and casually impales the one that tries to eat him on a tree. We then stumble upon the aftermath of this. We don't need a big display or cutscene showing him do it, just finding a snake that big impaled on an entire tree trunk shows his power. And as a bonus, it does so in an incredibly chilling way, since the implication is that this was nothing for him. But if we get caught by one of these snakes, we can really easily get whooped. So seeing him do it live in this big, bombastic moment in Rebirth feels like too much. We should be building back up to showcasing his power after everything that happened at the end of Remake. I feel like Sephiroth here in this moment, after we just experienced the flashback where he goes off the deep end and burns down Nibelheim, should be scary, not awe-inspiring. It's always possible, of course, that the original intent back in 1996 was to do a display like this, but the technology wouldn't really allow it at the fidelity they wanted, so they settled on a horrific display instead. But either way, I just don't see this moment as being quite as effective in Rebirth. Much further along, I think they should have kept the old mystery about Barrett potentially shooting up the battle square. Part of me wonders if they were afraid that might be controversial in the US, their biggest market, both for the racial implications and the unique issue we have with mass gun violence in public spaces here. Having a black man come in and be accused of shooting up an amusement park might have crossed a line they weren't willing to risk at this fidelity. But for me, I will always remember the heavy pit in my stomach at that point in the original, given how suddenly angry and impersonal Barrett had become since the party entered Corel. There was something special in the original that came from having to actually trust that Barrett wouldn't do that, trusting that you knew him well enough at that point. Also, the flashback when we see Scarlet shooting the gun was kind of poorly directed. Her just casually spilling bullets all over the place without much visible weapon recoil was silly. Equally silly was her shooting the arms several times before they let go. It was unnecessary. This feels like a minor place where they were like, 
Well, one bullet hitting the arm likely wouldn't lead to it needing to be amputated, or something, so they overdid it. But like, that type of realism in an instance like this is only relevant to the most pedantic among us, who aren't worth catering to. One bullet was enough. Dine's Resident Evil 8-esque metal powers were silly too, and made his showdown with Barrett feel less personal. Same with Palmer's frog mech fight right after. I think the Palmer fight should have come before meeting back up with Barrett or something, so it wasn't such tonal whiplash. It's also a bit of a shame that Dine didn't quite have a death on his own terms, like in the original. There were still aspects of this section that I liked a lot, so I came out relatively positive about it, even if it's absolutely not what I would have chosen for the most impactful part of the original game for me. All that being said, most likely it was once again about the rating. Having an extremely mentally ill person actually shoot up innocent people in an amusement park and then kill himself was probably a bit too much for a T rating at this graphical fidelity. And if that's the case, making a section like this effective gets a lot harder, so I understand why it didn't pan out perfectly. As I said a bit ago though, Cloud showing real support for Barrett at the end was worth it. Moving on, I'm also split on Nibelheim when we finally return to find it rebuilt. I think that Nibelheim being completely recreated with actors is another area of the original that the developer must have felt didn't quite fit a more comprehensive and fully realized world. It's a really dark and screwed up idea that I've always liked, especially when people angrily argue Cloud is lying about things like growing up there or having once lived in his childhood home. But we've seen enough of the technological capabilities of this world both in remake and in compilation stuff that I don't think that's something Shinra could realistically hide. So instead, in Rebirth, it feels like they chose to use marketing spin to make it look like they care enough to make up for their mistakes. It draws pretty strong parallels to the hollow corporate PR actions we see in our world today. You know, an electric company will burn down thousands of acres of forest and houses or something because their infrastructure was outdated and not properly maintained, and as a response, they'll offer a fake apology in one hand while trying to fight off the need to pay for all the property lost with the other hand. Then they'll make a marketing campaign where they're like, we are now going to plant a tree for every new customer we get over the next year, knowing that that's not going to be anything close to what they destroyed, knowing that it'll be considered charity that they can write off on their taxes, and knowing full well that in reality they should just be forced to replant the entire damned forest, but instead their customers will have to do so through their taxes. Same kind of thing here. It suggests that Shinra felt like they couldn't cover this one up because it was Sephiroth that did it, not a reactor explosion or whatever. Enough issues had cropped up that they were starting to get real heat, and because Sephiroth was one of their last few bastions of goodwill, and he was responsible for Nibelheim's destruction, that spelled really bad news for them. So instead of covering it up like normal, they admitted to the mistake and rebuilt the town. And as a further gesture of goodwill, they then built infrastructure there that they claim is designed to help people with terminal Mako poisoning. It's not as dark, but that still works for me. Initially, it felt really bizarre since everyone in town seems to know the party is Avalanche, and yet they're just kinda okay with them. But I think the idea here is that even these Shinra employees here aren't privy to what's really going on in the new Nibelheim. They're not normal Shinra executives or military personnel or whatever. They're doctors, nurses, and aid workers. They think they're actually just humanitarian medical employees who are taking care of poor souls with Mako poisoning, completely oblivious to the fact that they're being used as part of the Genova reunion theory experiment. That's chilling in its own way that's less tinfoil hat than the original, and again, draws more direct parallels to modern life that strengthens the anti-capitalist and anti-corporate messaging of Final Fantasy VII. It further illustrates just how heartless Shinra is willing to be to get what they want. They will plant medical workers in a town they rebuilt for good PR, knowing that the job these people are stationed there for is fruitless, and is actually designed to further more nefarious experiments that they they believe could lead them to untold profits, experiments related to the reason the town burnt down in the first place. They are wasting good-hearted medical professionals for money and good publicity that hides their misdeeds that caused Sephiroth to snap. 
It's not as pointed, melodramatic, and shocking as the original, and I therefore don't quite like it as much, but I think it speaks more soundly to the intended themes in a way that feels thoughtfully well-rounded. One small thing that kind of bothered me was also how the tiny Bronco just kind of goes down randomly while flying. I understand they felt they needed it to end up as a sea vessel here, so maybe it's actually irreparably damaged by Shinra in the next game still. In the original game, that story beat wasn't strictly necessary in terms of narrative value, but it was still one that got Sid to be just upset enough at Shinra to start severing his ties with them officially. I also am not the biggest fan of how the last chapter was handled, as so many aren't, though I think I understand the point pretty well, and the more I reflect on it, the more I do like it. I can definitely see it coming off as confusing, doubly so if you're the type of person who just refuses to get their head out of whatever fan theories they've internalized related to multiverse shenanigans. I too am bugged by the chaos of it at the end, and at first I was particularly bothered by the short scene where Aerith survives. I'm still holding my full opinions until the final part comes out, but my eyebrows were certainly raising in ways that weren't entirely pleasant. I also personally miss the scene where Cloud mourns never being able to experience Aerith's companionship again, and then later where she's left to sink slowly into the water. Her death isn't somber in the same way as it originally was, and is potentially undermined by the bombast of everything going on. But I also think refusing to give us that brutal, sorrowful mourning and then catharsis we were waiting for is the point. The game feels too smart for that to have been an accident. With that said, the choice to end things here does undermine this moment mechanically. In the original, we lost Aerith about halfway through the game, considering how short the third disc was, so we had plentiful time to use her in our party, but then we also had hours and hours to feel the gaping hole in our party right away. This event being in the middle of the game made it feel like our party was incomplete from then on, because there was no break where we had to wait for another game. To be clear, the problem isn't the amount of time we get with her here, or the amount of time we don't in the future. If anything, getting two full 40 plus hour RPGs with her could have made her absence all the more powerfully felt in the gameplay. The issue is that we got to have her for all of Rebirth, and then we'll start the third part without her. That hard cut works as an unfortunate mental break where the player gets to grieve and prepare for not having her in the next game. We had our fill, and now we get time to move on, so there's no immediate mechanical loss felt. Her moveset was unique enough that her absence will still hover over the entirety of the final game's gameplay. But short of playing all three games back to back sometime in the future, that gap leaves too much room where players can learn to be okay without her. That being said, the characters in the original were so homogenous mechanically that you were really only missing on limits, and while they're useful limits, most people will only obtain a few of them anyway. Here in Rebirth, at least we're losing a very bespoke, powerful, and unique moveset. We'll get back to the ending in a bit, but first I want to clean up some other things that I think people are woefully overreacting to. This bit might get a little ranty, fair warning. I've seen a lot of people complaining about Sid being softer than in the original, and I get it in theory, but also, he's barely in this? It's so easy, but also so pointless, to jump to the absolute worst conclusions, like that he's going to be completely neutered. But I'm fairly confident that even if the Sid we end up getting isn't the same Sid in the end, it'll be a quality Sid. He clearly wasn't supposed to have an arc in this game, considering he doesn't even officially join the party, and we don't go to Rocket Town. So I fail to understand why people are treating him like a failure already. I mean, think about it. How interesting is it that we've got gotten some time with Sid away from all of his baggage, and we'll probably get several more hours in part 3, if not a dozen or more with him like this. Hours that flesh him out as he wants us to see him. Remember that a huge part of Final Fantasy VII's theming is about identity, and characters wearing masks to hide parts of those identities they don't like. So we see this jolly, caring Sid for a while, only to realize once we get to Rocket Town that he's actually kind of a sexist, rotting pig gayness of a person in some ways? How interesting would it be to have to reconcile with that over the game from that angle, instead of him starting off as a stinky rectum man, and then him just sort of 
falling into the role of a comedic relief loudmouth along the way like in the original. Doesn't it potentially mean more if you first let him present as a kind, caring, gentle, and helpful soul, only to reveal he's part piece of shit after he's already integrated into the party? I've also seen some complaints about the two weapons we see in the game, with some people suggesting they're replacing existing weapons or that all weapons will just look like that with no proof of either complaint. It's like, nobody ever said these would be the only two weapons. In what way does the existence of these preclude the existence of Diamond, Sapphire, Ruby, Emerald, or Ultima? Same thing with Tifa falling in the life stream and not ending up with horrible Mako poisoning. I've seen people simultaneously complain that the game over explains everything, and then turn around and complain that stuff like this doesn't make sense, and is a much worse way to do the original life stream segment. But is it not possible that the idea here is that Tifa makes it out okay because she's not all screwed up in the head like Cloud is when he takes his dip in the original, and therefore her mind isn't in the same danger? She makes it out just fine in the original as well, remember? Is it not possible that this is supposed to lead into the same event we had in the original? She falls in now, understands a bit about the space, and because she's done this before by the time Cloud and her fall in in Medeal, it justifies why she can help him through it slightly better. And as I've said, I've even seen people assume this is a replacement for the original version of the livestream scene, but... <laughs> No, it isn't. This has nothing to do with Cloud's delusions related to Zack. This complaint completely fails to keep track of the intent of the scenes in the original. It's just surface level complaining because the scenes are similar. By the end, Cloud still doesn't know he's delusional, nor does Tifa, because remember, she still thinks he was never there. So why assume this is a replacement? If you dislike these new weapons because of their designs or something, or if you dislike the choice to have Tifa end up in the live stream by herself because you think it's unnecessary, these things are fine. If you dislike that they removed Aerith's want to fly on an airship, likely because it conflicts with Crisis Core's claims that she fears the sky, that's totally okay. But I'm baffled and disheartened by the fact that so many people default to, this is dumb, it doesn't make sense, as a response. All adaptations and remakes have to make choices. They have to choose what to keep, what to change, and what to let go of based on their specific intents with their adaptation. Different doesn't equal bad, nor is it inherently bad when something is missing or replaced. I think people are remarkably willing to dive into the intricacies of decisions made in the original FF7, and yet some of them are remarkably unwilling to try and meet the remake with the same level of thoughtful introspection and reflection. They point out every single thing that's different or missing, but refuse to give any attention to why that might be the case, or why something was added, unless they're forced to. It's important to remember that FF7 is one of the most important, influential games ever made. It has had over 25 years now to be dissected and explored, and has had a large spotlight and effort placed on that work the entire time. We can't really explore this remake to that degree this quickly, let alone when it's unfinished. So while it's totally okay to be bothered by or dislike or to be suspect of certain decisions, recognize that we're comparing a puzzle that was completed a quarter of a century ago and has subsequently been memorized down to the smallest detail by an avid community to a puzzle that's not only unsolved as of yet, but not all of the pieces are even available. I feel like someone's got to be pretty pretentious to assume that they know exactly how shallow or deep the intentions of every change here is already. That's not to say that criticisms aren't valid until the whole of Remake has been out for 25 years or whatever. It instead simply suggests that maybe whipping out your critical drinker hat is a bad idea. Maybe we shouldn't start arguing that the addition of two new whale-esque weapons somehow obviously contributes to a devastating series of bloody handprints, proving the game is attempting to murder the original. Maybe we shouldn't assume that what we see of Sid now is all that he encompasses. Maybe we should think a bit about why Tifa ends up in the live stream early, instead of immaturely assuming the writers are inept and we are the galaxy brains that have it all figured out. Because here's the thing, a lot of the assumptions about remakes ending that gained so much traction that they were treated as undeniable truths were wrong. 
Sometimes I feel like the game theory slash FNAF style of theory crafting has greatly obfuscated and damaged real, meaningful reflection on the value and intent of choices in games as art. Instead, a wealth of people have just started treating games as a series of facts to uncover by unraveling spaghetti lore as fast as possible. They'll use themes as a cover for the fact that they're just looking for Kingdom Hearts style fact dumps, remove the magic of the writing, and replace it with charts and timelines. I simply don't understand that kind of mindset, particularly when paired with the common argument that Rebirth has to over-explain everything. There are a bunch of things that are left unexplained but hinted at in Rebirth. As one example, we never get more on Aerith and Red talking early on, where he uses his real voice. We can assume what's going on and the reasons why he trusts her pretty easily, but the game leaves the depth of that relationship for us to contemplate. We're never really told who Cisne is or why she ended up in Gungaga. New players obviously won't know she was previously in the series. She might give some info if you pick the right question at the end of her quest, but I certainly didn't get any real info. It could be left for part 3, it could be left forever, but either way, currently it's left as is. And we can say the same thing about the narrative choices in Nibelheim that I talked about before. Some aspects of that area are very much left to inference. Pretty safe inference, but it's still not handed to you on a silver platter. You've got to think about it and dig a bit into what's actually going on to realize the intent was deeper than, let's change this for no meaningful reason. Which I suppose means... Just like with Remake, it's time to once again get into the ending more deeply and explain what I think is going on there. Because while it's absolutely confirmed that multiverse stuff is going on here now, I don't think it's quite what people are assuming it to be. I don't think the intent is to try and use the multiverse concept as a generic sci-fi trope. I think instead it's used spiritually here, tied directly to the life stream. The way I interpret it, I don't think the intent is to show us a bunch of alternate universes and then have the characters attempt to hop between them, or whatever shenanigans you'd usually see in multiverse stories. Instead, I think it's about suggesting that the planet already has the vast billions of years of knowledge collected within the life stream, its lifeblood. It has endless, boundless knowledge we could never even imagine. This is something established in the original, and is the core thing that Sephiroth was able to take advantage of after he fell in and somehow survived. He became part of it, and was basically able to commune with and watch the entire planet using said knowledge, to an even further degree than Aerith. With access to all aspects of all history, from every angle, he could see as if he was a god. He could see like the planet could see. I think the multiverse stuff is a manifestation of that part of what the life stream is, something they reinforce and remind us of several times in Rebirth. I don't think they expect players to look at every different universe as crucially important to the plot, nor do I think we're supposed to believe they're literally crossing over between universes to help each other. Instead, Zack and Aerith's spirits are manifesting from the life stream in this universe in the final battles. The Zack that helps Cloud during the final battle seems to get what's going on. He's not confused and wondering why Cloud isn't in a wheelchair in Midgar. He's not confused as to how he got there. Almost as if he's the dead Zack from the main timeline that knows he's dead, but his spirit is assisting. I believe that when Zack wakes up at the end, he feels the echo of his other self who died in the normal universe helping out the party, which is why he feels like it couldn't have been a dream. It's not that this alternate timeline Zack helped, it's that he recognized that another dead version of himself helped, his spirit, because they're intertwined. As if all the infinite possible futures can feel each other in some way and some instances, especially when crucial choices within a timeline are made, but they can't directly impact each other in the ways multiverse stories usually do. Notice how Cloud disappears during the climax, but nothing weird happens with the rest of the party. Only Cloud has help from Aerith or Zack, likely because of his ties to Sephiroth, Genova, etc. The different timelines are more like flashes of the knowledge of all the different different ways events could go through contact and connection with the life stream. These timelines are more like interpretations of that knowledge of the planet slash cetera stored in the life stream, and I think it's telling that by the end, the timelines are still all completely separate. 
Why would they be doing this stuff with other universes then? Well, we still have an entire game to go, so I can only really speculate. But I believe the goal is to reinforce things like the fact that all of Cloud's allies who have felt Death's cold sting have come to terms with it. That's what all of the flashbacks in the Temple of the Ancients were about, except for Red's. But his could very easily be about the death of an old version of himself. A version of himself that felt like just as much of a failure as he thought his father was at the time. Cloud is the only one that's left out both in the temple and in the final confrontation, not because he hasn't experienced the death of people who matter to him. His mother died after all, and he acknowledges that, but he also wasn't willing to face it. He wasn't able to face the death of Zack properly either, and he can't face Aerith's death properly in the end. Most people seem to have noticed that he's the only one that seems able to see Aerith after they take down Sephiroth. He's the only one that doesn't have his limit gauge filled with rage during the battle. He's the only one not talking about her loss. Heck, Cloud's main arc in Advent Children is even about finally trying to accept her death. The temple could tell he wasn't receptive, so it left him out of the reflection because he's not in a proper headspace for it. He's not himself. He's a puppet. But now that Aerith is dead, it's going to become inescapable. He can't pretend she's alive while surrounded by people who know she's dead. It's another fresh, central trauma in his life that can't be escaped this time. I suspect the third game will have him going through the stages of grief, which is blocked from properly happening thanks to the chaos Sephiroth sows in his head. It will be Aerith's spirit and Sephiroth's spirit in the livestream fighting over the ability to sway Cloud in one direction or the other. I think until Cloud comes to that acceptance and starts to properly grieve, he'll desperately need to find a way to revive Aerith by bringing her over from another timeline or something, which would also be a meta allusion to the fact that many fans for decades have wanted her to be revived. He'll eventually have to face the fact that she's dead. He can't bring her back. The separate universes are just that, separate, and he'll realize through wholly being summoned in Aerith then saving the world, as well as his time in the livestream with Tifa who seems to be mourning Aerith the hardest, that she's not actually gone. In the end, he learns that just because he needs to let go, that doesn't mean she's not still always with him. She's still in his heart, which similar to a lot of the other aspects of the compilation of FF7 games, integrates Advent Children's central character for Cloud into Final Fantasy VII itself. And this all ties directly back into the themes of loss that have always been a central part of FF7. This also feels like kind of an extension of Advent Children in terms of the presentation of life stream spirits, specifically the scene where Aerith contacts him, and the bit at the end where Aerith and Zack are shown together in the afterlife, something only Cloud seems to see. How interesting is the idea that Cloud has become an even more unreliable narrator in Remake than he was in the original. We don't get to see him fully mourn Aerith. We don't get to see them lay her to rest. Because similar to what happened between him and Zack, the Nibelheim incident, and large chunks of his own history and personality, he blocks it all out. He refuses to see Aerith as dead, so we as the player don't actually get to see and come to terms with her death yet either. I don't know about you, but that pretty smoothly fits with the themes and ideas of the original to me if you're not immediately jumping to the conclusion that they're trying to play Doctor Who with it. And imagine what kind of an emotional realization that can lead to in part 3, if and when he's forced to face it, and we get to see it all unabridged as it really happened. As everyone else in the party saw it, you thought you were getting to cry at Aerith's death and rebirth, but instead you have to wait a bit longer, just like Cloud. You have to wait until the good-hearted ex-soldier you're controlling is whole enough to face it. We complain about remakes being in overabundance in media these days, and while part of that is absolutely because sometimes it can be in place of something new being made, another part of it is that so many of the remakes are too needlessly safe and similar to the previous version. They're not distinct enough to have value beyond adding modern visuals, and yet here we get a remake that is very different and provides its own unique value, a remake that seems to have intent and vision, but instead of looking at it with fair eyes to see what might be special or interesting about 
about it. For a fair amount of people, there's this messed up race to the bottom to see in what ways we can dilute every slight difference from the original down into change bad, which then gives credence to the claims of the people who just wanted one of those safe, boring, new coat of paint remakes. I don't know about you, but I'd always rather have a bold remake that fails than a safe one that doesn't inspire. At this point, I genuinely think Aerith's death and rebirth was supposed to be unsatisfying, because Cloud is unsatisfied right now, and in that way, this is less of a sequel to the original FF7 and more of just a game that genuinely understands how complex its fan preferences are, the type of legacy the game has left, and how important its themes are to players. Why do we have to instead just assume they're flying by the seat of their pants? I get it. Nomura, Kingdom Hearts, Square, you can draw a pretty clear parallel between how messy and lore-obsessed KH gets and the potential future of this remake, but Kingdom Hearts wasn't even expected to make it past one game, and then it was spread across over a dozen games, half a dozen platforms with grossly different budgets, teams, and goals, and two decades just to get one core arc done. Remake is one project with one goal and one team on effectively one platform with similar budgets within half the time. And it also has the original game and 25 years of that game building a legacy as a guide. So much of this isn't new if you look at it this way. It's instead faithful. Sephiroth and Genova weaponized the knowledge in the live stream in the original. They weaponized hallucinations in Cloud's head. Aerith could communicate with Cloud in ways that were not physical, like the dream of her in the forest outside of the Forgotten Capital. But to see that, you have to stop trying to boil it down to multiverse sci-fi tropes, and then assuming the worst at every turn in order to get there. You have to actually understand the themes and ideas the original game presented, and how it went about presenting them beyond the most painfully obvious surface level elements. Think about the themes of identity and loss, and all of the core aspects of the original, you know? I just wish more people tried to treat the creators here with at least the basic level of respect they give the creators of the original. This stuff with Sephiroth manipulating Cloud is stuff I brought up in my remake video when everyone was talking about the whispers and fate and how both subsequent parts of this remake were absolutely going to be completely different and go way off the rails, even though it hasn't done that so far and the devs have repeatedly said it's not going to. like. Sometimes it just feels so bad faith. I get why some people are upset that we have a grand battle with Sephiroth at the end of both Remake and Rebirth, but why are so many people upset at it narratively, ignoring the fact that we're not actually fighting Sephiroth? Just like we were in the original, we're fighting Genova. The Sephiroth you chase in the original isn't Sephiroth. It's Sephiroth controlling Genova who can shapeshift. And even on a mechanical level, while I understand that more, I have to wonder why you think they can't make another quality fight with Sephiroth for the finale. I find it seriously hard to believe they couldn't make Nutsack Genova, Jesus Sephiroth, and Shirtless Sephiroth good enough on their own as fights. To once again go back to Kingdom Hearts, it has recycled the same handful of characters for boss fights just fine, and done it far more than just three times. I want to reiterate something I said in my remake video, which is that I can absolutely be wrong about a bunch of this. Unlike a lot of people, I'm not stating my thoughts as undeniable fact. And it's also not wrong to dislike any of the game's ideas or the way the game ended either, but I really don't think we're looking at a Kingdom Hearts, this is how vessels work, and this is how nobodies work, and this is how buttholes work type of exposition parade, but with multiverse fundamentals. I really do think the intent here is to expand on the spirituality of the life stream as a concept, as a culmination of all life that has been, is, will be, and could be on Gaia. And Genova aims to devour all of that for sustenance, erasing any possible future. The idea is that if Zack and Aerith live, the planet itself has to be doomed, and Cloud has to acknowledge that in order to become strong enough to defeat Genova and Sephiroth. Thanks to this reading, right now I don't mind the multiverse type stuff, because for the most part it can simply be seen as all the potential futures of the planet that Aerith and Sephiroth can see because of their connection to the life stream, or more likely the potential futures Aerith could see but can't after the conclusion of Remake. In effect, there are infinite possibilities, but only one conclusion at the end. One real timeline that will be where Gaia ends up when the dust settles.
With all of the story discussion out of the way, I think it's worth sharing how I think the story in the third game will be structured, particularly because I've seen several people worried that losing Cloud right at the start of the third game is a horrible pacing choice, because Rebirth should have instead gone up to that point and then stopped. Firstly, I think it'll start with Wutai, because of the reignited war with Shinra. I think there will also be another stop or two at Wutai across the rest of the game. Then we'll probably head to Rocket Town to learn of the huge materia. At that point, we'll finally make our way to the Icicle Inn area, then North Crater where we'll lose Cloud. That way we get substantial time with Cloud before we lose him. From here, it mostly lines up with the original, but considering how anemic this section originally was, I think expanding each major plot point out will be very fruitful. So after we lose Cloud, we'll end up with Tifa as the leader, in hopefully open-ended Midgar. We'll find Cloud in Medeal after exploring an expanded area around it, and that'll lose us Tifa as well. Up next would be the Fort Condor equivalent and Corel for two huge materia, with Sid in charge. We'll regain Cloud and Tifa after they fall in the live stream, and then do the underwater reactor huge materia, and then we'll go to Rocket Town again to prevent the last one from being blown up. This will give us ample time with the real Cloud who is finally able to start recovering from everything that has happened since the Nibelheim incident. Then we'll head to Midgar again to end Shinra and Hojo, and finally North Crater to finish dealing with Sephiroth. I think there will also be a stop at the Shinra mansion along the way, because I suspect they'll add in mandatory Lucrezia stuff for Vincent, and that is now a solid location for it, rather than some random secret cave. It's really not that difficult to see a through line where we don't lose Cloud right away, where Sid gets a chance to be revealed as kind of a dick, where we then lose Tifa and have to play as this stinky Sid as the leader, and then regain them and continue forward. Because it's important to remember that a couple of locations were missing from Rebirth, probably for this specific purpose. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the story. I liked it a lot, more than Remake, which I already thought was pretty dang great and faithful. I'm interested to see where they'll go, because even if they fail, the original will still always be there. We can all be adults with our big boy and big girl pants on, and ignore Remake if Part 3 ends up being utter garbage somehow. And for the 50th time in this video, I'll say that if it is great, but you don't like it anyway, that's cool. But goddamn, are they trying their hardest, and it's extremely clear that basically everyone on this project is enjoying it immensely. And as an artist myself, that is the most important part of this whole thing. That artists who love the original are able to be artists on this project, instead of slaves to pedantic expectations and arbitrary canon bullshit. While Final Fantasy VII's characters and story are incredibly important to me, as I've said many times over the years, I'm someone who also places equal importance on the gameplay in JRPGs. And in fact, it's much easier for me to put up with a JRPG with a bad story but great gameplay than the reverse. And Rebirth does not disappoint in that regard. It's absolutely not perfect, mind you, but just like with Remake, they took balance very seriously and really understood their own intents and stuck with them instead of catering mindlessly to whatever generic wishes the market at large had for them. Unlike with some of the story theory crafting crowd, fans are usually very well meaning when they ask for mechanical things like FF12 style gambits, or better air combat for characters in a game like this, but that doesn't mean they understand the impact of that on the systems as a whole. Rebirth's combat is masterful, and is the best action RPG combat I've ever played because it knew what it wanted and needed to be and hit the nail on the head, instead of catering purely to fan wishes. But surprisingly, it's also because it didn't ignore the wishes of these well-meaning fans. It was willing to find ways to compromise with these wants without sacrificing the core of the combat in the process. Let's take those two examples I just gave, people who wanted a gambit system and people who wanted better air combos for melee characters. Gambits, for those who don't know, were the central pillar of Final Fantasy XII's combat. These are basically generic if-slash-then statements that the player could slot onto characters in a list. The nature of these statements and the order of them built a basic AI system for each party member. So if you want your character to heal allies who dip below 50% health, then you would pick the if an ally is at 50% or less health part of the statement and combine it with a spell like Cure. Or maybe you keep losing to a boss because single target heals take too long, so other party members keep getting low on health while they're healing someone else. 
you could change Cure to Cura, which is a multi-target spell. This could waste MP if nobody else needs that heal at the moment, because it won't ever use less expensive single target spells now, but it could also save your life. Or maybe you could implement both versions at different HP levels, Cura at less than 20% and Cure at 50%. Then you could put the Cura statement above the Cure one so that it is prioritized if someone is that low on health, and both of these statements could go above your attack highest HP enemy statement. Maybe silence is really bad for a specific character in your party, so you set up a gambit that uses an item to cure it, because items come out instantly where spells don't. But below that, you have a Suna attached to a gambit for whenever any party member has a status ailment, so that the slower spell will be used for any other ailment, but the item will always be used for silence. Get the idea? Well, this wouldn't work in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth just like it wouldn't have worked in Remake. The reason is because the goals of these systems are different. I understand how people might think it would work, and I'm someone who for a decade straight argued that every game with AI companions should use a Gambit system. And honestly, I still do think that most of them could benefit from it, but not Remake and Rebirth. In the original version of Final Fantasy XII, every character was basically a carbon copy of each other. They were all blank slates without any of their own unique mechanics. The same is true for the later Zodiac job system and Zodiac Age versions, although in those, you spec into specific job classes that make them unique. The point, in either case, was to emphasize automating as much about your characters as possible, based on the role you want them to fill. You as the player then cherry pick specific alternative actions you want them to take in the heat of battle, which you haven't built gambits for. You're supposed to build an autopilot system for every character so they synergize well and work efficiently on their own, and then you handle the minor course corrections. In Final Fantasy VII Remake and Rebirth though, the point is to get the player to actively engage with every party member and their very unique, very bespoke combat styles. They do not, under any circumstances, want you to pick a single character and stick to them like your Velcro. Nor do they want your AI to be so competent that they can carry fights for the player. Gambits would completely undermine that. If you could automate when your characters use spells and use their abilities and whatnot, there's much, much less incentive to switch to them, especially because they'd be using their ATB bars as soon as they earn them, meaning you'll never have any reason to switch to them to use those bars. But also, this combat system is too fast for Gambits. How much would it suck if you take a particularly bad hit and right as you're about to ask Tifa to send you some heals, she uses her ATB on unbridled strength. Each action in Final Fantasy XII meant less than in Rebirth, because a turn is a flat, very low cost component of battle. It is basically the lowest cost element to battle, especially once you've stacked up a bunch of the MP regenerating abilities. But an ATB bar in Remake is instead earned through proper play, and your ability to earn them can be heavily supplemented or hampered depending on your situation. Combine that with the low amounts of MP characters have, and there is a massive cost associated with wasting an ATB bar. Waste a turn in 12, and you're going to be fine 99% of the time because another identical turn is just 3 or so seconds away. Waste an ATB in Rebirth, and it can be devastating. So you realistically don't want the AI to be using them for something you programmed into them as soon as they get the ATB bar. And that's to say nothing about how gambits would interact with the character you're currently controlling. In 12, turns were your only actions. In Rebirth, Core combat and ATB actions are separate systems. Do they just automatically turn the gambits off if you're controlling that character? Do those gambit actions interrupt whatever else you're doing? How does this affect the fact that the AI characters are designed to keep themselves alive by blocking first and foremost? It would likely mean they're hit by devastating attacks much more often, because they'll be spamming ATB actions as soon as they're available, rather than blocking and focusing on staying alive until you tell them it's safe to do otherwise. Because of this, any automation the game allows you to have access to has to be highly limited, simple, and match the cost to the output. And shockingly, Rebirth responded to the calls for a gambit system with some extra materia specifically designed for minor automation. Remake had one or two materia that were kind of similar, most notably the synergy materia.
area. Synergy makes it so that when you tell the character you're controlling to take certain actions that consume ATB, the ally with Synergy on would follow that up automatically with whatever spell materia it's attached to. This would be broken as heck if they use the highest level spell on the attached materia though. It would likely unintentionally waste MP because just like a gambit, there's no user control beyond how you set it up. Nobody wants to be in a situation where you finally stagger a boss that's got you on the ropes by using a spell with Cloud, and instead of being able to use Barret's remaining MP to heal back up in this short opening, he automatically spends that MP and ATB bar on a Thundaga. So, instead, the spell that's attached to Synergy doesn't cost MP or an ATB bar when Synergy activates it. If you left it there, though, that would be broken in the opposite direction, because you could trick your allies into doing no-cost level 3 spells like Thundaga all the time. So they had to also limit it to the level 1 version of that spell. And again, that's before refactoring cast times. Nobody wants Barret to start automatically queuing up a Thundaga that'll take him 3 seconds to cast, only to get smashed into the dirt because he's not blocking. Level 1 spells come out quickly enough that this is much less likely an issue. See how complex these issues get when you're trying to give AI extra autonomy without screwing over other elements of combat? Generally, players are much more frustrated when an AI takes an action and it leads to an awful outcome than when an AI fails to take an action that you know it can't take to begin with, and that failure to take action has no negative impact. Now though, there are several more options than Synergy. Autocast is a more aggressive version of Synergy, where the AI will automatically use the linked materia whenever it feels it's relevant, and this one does cost ATB and MP. Yes, that doesn't give the player much control, but as a small appeasement, it also gives the character a small boost to their magic stat when the materia is maxed out. Autocast can use any relevant level of the spell that it's linked to, but it seems to prioritize only using the most powerful version on offer when in emergency situations. That way it's not wasting tons of ATB or MP. Auto Unique Ability is a materia that allows that ally to use their Triangle Button ability automatically, so Aerith will teleport to her wards when relevant, Tifa will use Unbridled Strength and then use the associated attacks, Red will automatically enter Vengeance Mode, etc. Similarly, Auto Weapon Ability allows allies to use options in their ability list in the command menu. This will specifically use whatever ability they got from the weapon they currently have equipped. And while this isn't strictly an AI augmentation materia, Precision Defense Focus will make it much more likely that your allies parry attacks, meaning if they block, they take no damage at all. Obviously, this isn't a massive list of options for having the AI take more actions, but they are still there, and their limitations still push the player toward controlling every character in battle, as is intended. It's of little doubt to me that the combat team on this remake has heavily experimented with different forms of player controlled AI options, and maybe they'll figure something more out in the final game, but if you ask me, Anything approaching the Gambit system is so antithetical to the main point of the combat systems in this game that it would only hurt and dilute the final product. I understand the initial inclination, but I think it's fundamentally flawed and I do not want to see Gambits in this game. Even if it worked perfectly, Enemies and bosses would have to be scaled up in power and health to compensate for your increased party effectiveness which would further lead to disastrous consequences when the AI fails you. No thanks. The other example I mentioned above, making air combat better for melee characters, is much easier to explain. In Remake, air combat with melee characters kinda sucked. Yes, it was frustrating that it didn't feel that good, but the reason it was limited was specifically because if melee characters were too good at handling ranged enemies, there's little reason to use your ranged characters to handle those threats. So if you make melee characters better in the air, you have to find a new way to make ranged characters relevant. Well, Rebirth found a solution in Synergy Abilities. Synergy Abilities are a new mechanic, along with Synergy Skills, that allows your characters to work together directly. Synergy Skills have no cost, and are more like augmentations to your potential playstyle. Someone like Barret can be asked to block with you against an attack, which is basically like a wider parry window. Or you could ask him to toss Tifa into the air, so she can get off some good air combos or avoid an attack. These can be used easily, quickly, and repeatedly. Repeatedly. Synergy abilities, though, are much more powerful and have to be built up to. There are four types, one that temporarily gives both characters three ATB bars, 
one that temporarily removes the MP cost of spells for both characters, the third type will extend the time that an enemy is staggered, and the final type will level up both characters' limit breaks, allowing them to use new limits. On top of this, most of these abilities work kind of like weaker but still powerful cooperative limit breaks, stunning and doing damage to the enemy. However, in order to use a synergy ability, both characters have to have filled up enough pips in their synergy gauge. How do you do that? By having them use abilities that cost ATB. Most abilities count, but that means if you want to access these very powerful synergy abilities and their temporary boosters like no MP cost, you have to use them both enough to fill up enough pips in the synergy gauge. And what's more, after your first use of a synergy ability in a battle, the cost increases, meaning if you want to use it again, both characters will have to use 5 ATB abilities each. So now, the people who want to use melee characters for ranged enemies can do so, and it feels pretty excellent with the new aerial abilities they added, good air control, etc. But at the same time, ranged characters are still great at doing ranged damage from a safe distance while contributing directly to the party. They also gave ranged characters some extra spice, with options like Barret's bonus round, which massively increases his ability to build stagger on enemies with his basic attacks. And now you can only enter air combat with melee characters by using actions that will make them airborne instead of them automatically leaping into the air every time. All of this asks the player to be more active in combat to get what they want. Want more? How about the fact that they recognized in Remake how smart it was to keep weapons viable from the beginning of the game to the end, but the way they handled the weapon leveling system was slow and tedious. Well, in Rebirth, weapons level automatically, and the skill tree-esque system used for each weapon was changed into the new Folio system. It's basically the same idea, but more focused, and it applies to all weapons that character has at once, more like a character skill tree. That means you don't have to tediously upgrade each weapon for each character one at a time. You just upgrade each character as needed. The abilities are also more interesting, and as your weapon level grows, your individual weapons gain new passive passives that you can equip in the Materia menu, which along with their varying stat focuses and Materia slots, helps make each weapon still feel individualized. What about how slow it was for Cloud to put away his weapon after breaking boxes in Remake? That was kind of annoying, right? Because until he put it away, you couldn't really start jogging, let alone sprinting, anywhere. In Rebirth, though, not only does he get moving faster, but you can cancel the recovery animation with a roll. Abilities have similarly been refined in terms of ATB cost, speed, type, and other balancing factors. The highest end offensive spells cost 2 ATB now, for example, but cost a bit less MP. But other attacks, like Ray of Light, can be used with only 1 ATB now, giving it more utility. Speaking of, Aerith's wards are more interesting, and you still have access to Tempest by holding square, while her new triangle option teleports her to any ward she currently has available. Cloud's Punisher stance was a bit overpowered in the original. Here, it's good for big groups, maintaining stun on enemies, and building stagger when enemies are pressured, but it doesn't have the same combination of speed, power, and range it had before, making use of it more thoughtful. And the addition of Prime Mode as an alternative to Punisher Mode, and the fact that they can add Berserk and Fury to greatly boost damage potential, is much more rewarding than it was before, without undermining the standard Operator Mode. Operator Mode, likewise, now has an inbuilt AoE option, ranged blade projection, Projectiles that fire out quickly after a dodge, and his dodge has better range and can clip enemies for extra damage. Barret's options like bonus round are incredibly useful as I explained before, as are the MP free quick element attacks you can unlock for everyone, and Tifa feels more well rounded thanks to stuff like her unbridled strength alternative, Unfettered Fury, that deals magic damage instead of physical. As I've mentioned a few times now, they carried over Yuffie's parry mechanic from intermission, except now everyone can use it, completely negating damage with a well-timed button press. Summons can also be used much more frequently if you wish, since there's more space in most battles, and more reasons to keep small summons equipped. There are also more opportunities to battle more freely due to the lack of linearity. 
That being said, the biggest weakness of summons in this open world context is that against random mobs, the summon bar fills too slowly for them to be viable a fair amount of the time, at least on normal mode. The dynamic difficulty setting might be tough enough in comparison to change that, but on normal, you'll usually have a fight nearly done by the time a summon is ready, so that ATB is probably better served on abilities to finish things. Red 13's moveset is great for support, and he just feels good to throw around the battlefield. And K-Sith has a higher skill floor than the others, but is rewarding to get the hang of and rather powerful in his own right. What's most impressive to me is that they were able to create these characters, balance them, and yet still have them feel completely unique within the party. I'm also relieved that the Junon part of the demo wasn't completely representative of the final game. In the Junon demo, you had access to three Magnify Materia, which allows you to multi-target spells. Getting access to three or more Magnify that early is a terrible idea. It was one of the core failures of the original Final Fantasy VII because Magnified spells are so powerful. In Remake, you could only get one Magnify around halfway through the game, and it wouldn't reappear if you replayed the chapter post-game, so you had to choose a single spell on a single character that could be multi-target. In Rebirth, you still get Magnify pretty late, and don't get to just buy and spam them. There are three total, but you have to work for them, so spreading spells to multiple targets is still limited in a way that requires thinking about combat instead of simply spamming magnified healing or what have you. And the low max MP values will make spamming even less effective. Speaking of low MP, these absolutely crazy devs included the HP MP conversion materia from the original game, which swaps your maximum HP for your MP and your MP for your HP. That's insane considering most characters will have less than 80 MP for most of the game. Just wanted to note that because I think it's fun. The devs were also aware of how annoying their boss phase changes could be in Remake, because they blocked damage output to show a cutscene, so in Rebirth there are significantly fewer of them. This means you don't waste limit breaks or other super powerful abilities at random nearly as often as in Remake. The outcome of all of this is a game that has the exact same multi-character combat focus that made Remake so damned good, with even better game feel and variety, and the same phenomenal balance. There are still places where I feel like the combat could be improved of course. The AI is generally fantastic as it was last time, especially now that they can parry to avoid damage altogether. Also, I noticed that whenever the AI did make mistakes and start to get stomped, it was infrequent enough and the characters were endearing enough that I was more worried about the party member than I was frustrated about their mistakes. Like, it was the type of response you'd have to a real friend making a mistake, a person, not a fictional character. I can't say I've really ever felt that in another game, because usually I'm in complete control or the AI has just enough faults to lack anything approaching that kind of immersion. But this doesn't entirely apply to the post-game challenges, which can be so difficult that a single missed block from an AI can be devastating to a strategy. The brutal challenges Chadley offers you after you beat the game are pretty solid challenges, and the legendary ones for each individual character are generally decent challenges as well. Like, most of these are really damned difficult. I can absolutely see why many people are calling them overtuned. But the only one that I felt was unacceptably challenging was the Bonds of Friendship challenge, where you're forced to use a pre-built Zack and Cloud with nobody else. Zack is strong, just like Sephiroth is in his similar challenge, and you can make Cloud incredibly powerful too, but similar to a fair amount of these post-game offerings, one mistake on your part or a couple on the part of any AI partner can mean failure. It really does feel like you're expected to use a limited selection of strategies to win, and all of them require either incredible skill and precision or luck. I was stuck on Bonds of Friendship for around 20 hours, which is quite possibly longer than I've ever even been stuck on a Souls boss. It was absolutely one of the most challenging things I've ever done in a game, and huge props go to Optinoob for their step-by-step -step video guide on it. A lot of people have made guides on the MP Absorb Wind strategy for Bonds of Friendship, but Optinoob was the first one I saw who offered cheeky tricks for a handful of the fights that either no longer made them a frustratingly repetitious roadblock, or turned what was a huge bowl of frustration and luck into a cakewalk. Bahamut and Odin were still ridiculous, and losing to Odin was always unspeakably infuriating, since he was the last fight of the challenge. But realizing you could do things like stop Titan before he can even get a shield 
shield up, or that carefully timing your Arogas against Kujata prevents him from ever entering any elemental state were absolutely genius. For me, the dual summon fights before Gilgamesh, as well as Gilgamesh himself, were the peak of the difficulty balance for optional content, before I could start to feel the pressure of potential overtuning. Hard mode was also solid and didn't feel overtuned. Hard mode is great, just like last time. If you never played it in Remake, it's designed as a new game plus mode, except you no longer gain MP back from resting and you can't use items. You'll only regain all of your MP at the start of each chapter, so you have to heavily ration it. And again, they understood potential player frustrations and tried to avoid them. Did you get all of the fast travel points in your initial playthrough? Use the closest fast travel point and skip the Junon area and head straight to under Junon. This means you can really focus on just clearing the necessary challenges, though one of the interesting things about hard here is that you still can do optional content if you want, and since this game is much bigger and more sprawling than Remake, that's kind of a terrifying but exhilarating concept. At this point, hope is dwindling, but I do hope that they nerf the Bonds of Friendship challenge a bit in an update, because like, you're getting to play as Zack and Sephiroth more, with their own comprehensive movesets, to the point that I suspect if they make an intermission style DLC for Rebirth, it's probably going to be a Crisis Core themed one, where you play as Zack and Sephiroth more, and Genesis is going to be their super boss. I don't like Genesis as a character, but I can't pretend that he wouldn't make a great VR super boss like Vice did. But I kinda want to enjoy playing as Zack and Sephiroth rather than constantly being a few seconds of failed blocks from losing, like I am in challenges like Bonds of Friendship. And the difficulty of Bonds of Friendship pushes me away from ever wanting to do a 100% run of this game again. The post-game additions in general are all exactly the type of things you'd hope for. Heavily increased AP and EXP earnings, hard mode also allows you to skip tons of the mini-games and things you were forced to do on a fresh file. No buying swimsuits in Costa del Sol. No needing to heal Pico up when you're in Corral Prison. You can skip the buggy chase after the dine segment, and much, much more. Chapter skipping is a thing too, so you can hop around to any point in the game you want to, with the lightning fast load times making it ever easier. And you can choose whether or not you want to reset side quests, while the game still always retains completion of them, which you can revert back to. And unlike in Remake, the VR challenges that force you to be on hard difficulty no longer require you to be playing on hard at the time. They'll swap you to hard for the challenge itself and then back to your current setting when you're done. The only ones that are restricted depending on the chapters or settings are those that use specific party members. If you're in a chapter where someone like Kate Sith isn't in the party, you gotta go to a chapter where they are. But just going to chapter 13 fixes that, and it has an extremely quick start with Chadley right around the corner. After you beat the game, you can also change into most of the costumes you used across the game, and you can use them anywhere. They also offer options for changing the amount of slowdown the command menu gives you, the ability to skip the Zack interludes, the ability to choose who you get to date during the date scenes, whether it's the intimate date scene or not, and more. This really feels like the pinnacle of quality of life. It feels like a game where they thought extremely hard about what things were a common annoyance upon game completion or replay, and worked at their hardest to smooth out those frustrations. Not all of it is perfect, of course. As with a lot of others, I wish you could save materia setups and switch between them. It didn't bother me on my first playthrough, but by the time I got to the post-game stuff that pushes you extremely hard, I wanted to be able to test builds without managing menus of materia for hours. Hours. And that's especially true for hard mode, because you're likely rushing through it, meaning the party formation is changing out constantly, and there's no easy way to put your best setups on each party configuration quickly. They still haven't even included the original FF7's full system, where you could swap your whole party's materia around at once. You can access everyone's materia slots simultaneously, but I miss the ability to select the whole row of someone's materia at once and move it. That turns like 80 button presses per character into 5 or 6. It condenses a minute of swapping materia into 10 seconds, and it should be here. While grinding out materia I needed or wanted to get to max level, I also realized that the materia list kinda needs nested menus. You might think you only need 3 of each magic materia at most, for example, but sometimes you want more for very specific builds. If you want Cloud to be able to swift cast Aroga for half MP and gain MP and HP back from it at the same time, he needs 4 wind materia 
all by himself. So your lists of materia get pretty long by the end. Instead of having to scroll past all eight different fire materia or what have you, I should be able to scroll past a single fire, which when I click into will then display all of my fire materia in order from highest level to lowest. The game has page up and page down functions with the left and right on the d-pad, but Rebirth is expansive enough that this function no longer feels adequate by the post game. Rebirth also tries to give you a lot of options for retrying after you fail in the middle of a boss gauntlet, but these options aren't exactly clear and because there are sometimes so many, it's easy to pick the wrong one. Just do yourself a favor, use retry before last battle, not retry last battle in the final boss gauntlet, or gauntlets like the battle square section where you fight Corneo, the Turks, and Rufus. Despite the names, the former will start you at the last segment, and the latter will start you over from the beginning. Unfortunately, while I love how much combat-centric challenge content there is in this game, I'm not the biggest fan of the fact that there are so many places to do compartmentalized or simulated battles. I like extra battles, I like more combat, but some of these challenge battle locations feel like bloat. I don't need VR battles with Chad Lee, VR battles in the Gengaga area, arena battles in the Gold Saucer, arena battles in Corel Prison, and VR battles in the Shinra Manor, etc. I just feel like more of these could have been open world battles that were guarding treasure chests to their rewards. A lot of them don't have unique gimmicks, so I feel like having more of them in the open world could be good. What's more, once you get to the post-game stuff, they endlessly reuse a select few enemies, primarily optional fights like hunt enemies and summon battles. I understand not wanting to risk people getting tired of mandatory fights by reusing them so much, and I also understand that making tons of extra enemies just for optional super challenging VR and arena fights would have been a lot of work for a game that already offers so many great enemies and so much phenomenal combat. And most every configuration they throw at you in Chadley's challenges, whether that be based on enemy mob configurations or mandatory party setups, is uniquely challenging in the harder challenges. But it's still kind of tiring when you're asked to fight Titan, Kujata, Mind Flayer, and a large handful of others a billion times. I'm also kind of disappointed by the Battle Square and the Gold Saucer. It also has a fair amount of unique gimmick battles, but I really liked the slots mechanic from the original and was hoping it would be implemented here. Maybe even in a sort of Crisis Core DMW sort of way, as a cute homage to that. But as it stands, while it has several fun, interesting battles with clever challenges and gimmicks, it just feels like more arena battles they could have placed anywhere rather than a unique gold saucer attraction. Which I suppose is as good of a segue as any into the minigames and other aspects of Rebirth's design, something I was fearing immensely leading up to release. I recently got the Platinum Trophy on Yakuza Kiwami, meaning I had to utterly exhaust and gain expertise in basically every one of the plethora of minigames it had on offer. And that's a good comparison point for Rebirth. Yakuza Kiwami was great to play, and there were aspects of the wide variety of side content that I enjoyed, but it's also designed very punishingly in this regard, and not every minigame is particularly well crafted. Firstly, it desperately wants you to master every minigame, and pushes you to do nearly everything on offer to an extreme level of comprehensiveness. Many minigames have no options for making them easier if you want to complete them, and the ones that do, the gambling games primarily, only offer help through finite, extremely limited consumables that you absolutely can waste. In many of these cases, these consumables also either still require that the player does extremely well before capitalizing on it by using said consumable at the right time, or the consumable simply can't be used to complete several of the hardest objectives. And because a lot of them are gambling, luck will play an enormous part whether or not you're using a consumable. You have to get good at Mahjong to complete it. You have to get pretty good at the pocket circuit racer game to complete it, even with a guide. Same with darts, bowling, billiards, batting, and karaoke. Karaoke is broken. Some songs literally don't line up with the inputs, every new line of notes changes speeds, and that makes how it leads from one line to the next unpredictable. Sometimes notes come right at the beginning or the end of a line in a way that leads to unfairly missed inputs as well. 
The Colosseum is so tedious to grind, but you'll have to in order to get enough of the weapons and armor pieces along the way. The card game, Mesu King, isn't that difficult, but it's still somewhat based on luck because it's basically rock, paper, scissors, and it still expects a wealth of time and effort from you. There's also the Cabaret Club minigame, which falls prey to the classic multiple choice conversation issue where the preview of your choices often doesn't match the actual response Kiryu gives. After you beat the game, you're then expected to fulfill a bunch of requests from a specific character, which force you to spend hours running around and engaging with more of these minigames. You also have to literally walk around with them for a kilometer, which is like 20 minutes worth of wasted time. You can't jog, you can't run, you can't sprint, you have have to walk. And don't even get me started on the climax battles, which are generally interesting in concept, but also sometimes feel like they stretch a specific mechanic or fighting stance or whatever way too far. None of them are as hard as Bonds of Friendship in Rebirth, but they certainly often feel much less polished, undertuned rather than overtuned. It's not that the minigames in Yakuza Kiwami are bad, instead, they don't always get the polish or variety they need, or they completely fail to have player expectations that match the polish and variety, and the game expects you to master such a huge variety of different types of content that one thing or another will inevitably become a roadblock that just sucks all of the fun right out of it. I want to give it a bit of a pass, since none of it is mandatory to finish the game, but it still goes too far. Despite only taking me around 90 hours to play through the entirety of Kiwami for the first time, and get the Platinum Trophy, I'd say roughly half of that time was just grinding and tedium, purely because it couldn't get the refinement it needed. In Rebirth, though, I think the minigames here are somehow amazingly generally pretty solid. As I said in my video on Remake, you can't make such richly detailed versions of these environments, which is necessary for a fully 3D game, without justifying them through time spent in them. These environments need to be this expansive to match the freedom of movement, camera controls, and general detail density of a modern AAA title, and that necessitated the environments being really expensive. Too expensive to spend 10 minutes in them and then leave, never to return like you would so often do in the original game. The scale needed to to feel more real than three building interiors and a single outdoor screen like they used to be. Being able to sprint from one end of a resort town like Costa del Sol to the other in five seconds wouldn't work, so it was smart that they filled them with minigames, as that was no doubt cheaper and better for pacing than bloating them three times as much with scripted story events. Story events and story-related side quests are still here, but they're interspersed between town exploration, world exploration, and the minigames. And thankfully, for many of these minigames, you don't need to master them to move on with the story, or to earn all of the rewards and reach the Platinum Trophy. There's no need to finish Nanaki Soccer in first place to continue with the narrative, and in cases like gathering Costa del Sol swimsuits, you also only have to complete half of the minigames on offer on a fresh file, if you don't care about getting extra beachwear options. And again, some minigames are skippable even on the first playthrough, like the Queen's Blood Tournament on the Shinra 8 ship. Minigames themselves range from very simple button timing exercises, to fun and deep distractions, to pastimes so comprehensive that they deserve their own full games. Chocobo racing is pretty great here, and there's a lot of variety in how you can set your chocobo up. I suspect that the third game will see Bill's Ranch empty out, so we'll be able to breed and race our own chocobos, but what we have here is still great. Great. Fort Condor is simplified from intermission, but is also smoother thanks to that. The final proto-relic Fort Condor match sucks if you don't exploit a specific strategy though, and hard mode for them obviously gets even more challenging, but that strategy will also dominate most of them if you just don't care. I don't hate Fort Condor, but the harder it gets, the less it feels like a mini RTS of sorts, and the more it feels like a puzzle to be solved with a specific solution and a bunch of distractions to obfuscate that solution. The piano minigame is good overall, and it comes with rather wide note activation windows, both in terms of where you're aiming the stick, and in terms of when you time your input. That makes it far less tedious if you simply aren't into this kind of thing, however, on the hardest songs that wide window can mess you up pretty bad once you make a mistake. But it also doesn't expect you to have a perfect star rating on any song, and there's no failing so you just have to practice and improve. Gears and Gambits is fun and interesting, and I do appreciate the fact that they acknowledge 
gambits here. It's a really comprehensive minigame, and you can change the difficulty of it directly if you're having a hard time. G-Bike is a bit weird, just like in the original, because the minigame is about cutting down Shinra soldiers in a Shinra-sponsored amusement park. I don't know why they didn't change them to Avalanche soldiers, or wu Tian soldiers, but it feels good here. Same with the spaceship shooter that has such killer background music. The 3D Brawl minigame is fine, but I'm terrible at processing the tells for the opponents. Sephiroth in particular is brutal, one of the hardest things in the game, honestly, and I had to pause buffer to have any hope, but pause buffering is such a boon that basically anyone can win with it. This is honestly a prevailing narrative that flows across all of the minigames. Either they have direct difficulty settings to manage, they don't expect too much from the player, or the developers left in exploits and super optimal strategies that can make it far easier. If the game wasn't so respectful of the player in other ways, I'd chalk this up to luck, but at this point, I honestly think leaving in those exploits was intentional. I think they expected players to be adults instead of, you cheated not only the game, but yourself. You didn't grow. You didn't improve. Yeah, instead of that fucking garbage. I believe they simply realized that the people who needed help finishing all of the random minigames that have completely different mechanical requirements from the core game should be able to do it since the rewards often tie back into the core game. But people who wanted to master it fair and square should be responsible enough to not ruin their own fun, and that's also why I don't think they gave you that type of shortcut when it comes to the hardest combat challenges. That's the game, and most of the rewards you gain for doing things in the game tie back into that part of the game. So if you're not into it, there's no reason for you to try these combat challenges in the first place. Play the story, play the minigames, explore the world, and then be done, you know? But the minigames have to be balanced in a more relaxed way because many people might be playing them for the rewards that tie back into combat, the central pillar of the game. Anyway, there are plenty of less involved minigames, like even though it's for a proto-relic, the Cactor challenges with Kid G primarily use combat mechanics, meaning they don't diverge vastly from what you're already doing. The Chocobo gliding courses in Cosmo Canyon are a bit tedious and needlessly precise, but there are only a handful and they barely last more than a minute at the longest. I was stuck on one for a while, but all of them in total took me maybe 30 minutes. The Wackabox minigames here were both expanded to be more entertaining and also simultaneously made easier than in Remake, and especially easier than the Nightmare version in Intermission's hard mode. I actually quite enjoyed them here. The camera in the Junon Parade minigame is far less chaotic than in Remake's Honey Bee in Dance, and timing is easier to parse due to refined UI elements. You can also set your own difficulty by choosing different groups of soldiers to be a part of the parade. I still like the exercise minigame this time around in theory, but it still ends up being just as tedious here as in Remake, and because of that is probably the only minigame I outright dislike. They also made it harder than before thanks to using L2 and R2 along with the PS5's adaptive trigger feature, which I turned off specifically for this minigame. Similar to Remake, finishing every challenge here also required me to turn the music basically all the way down because it was too distracting to my rhythm. Cactuar picture hunting was fun, as was Nanaki soccer. The minecart section and other similar things were fine, unobtrusive. The Moogle catching minigame was fun enough, and it was one that didn't overstay its welcome for me. I never failed one, but if this is something you're not good at, I can absolutely concede that it might feel too hard by the end. Same kind of thing with the Fall Guys style frog minigames. Polished, but maybe a tiny bit too hard, so it could feel obnoxious for some. Though, following opponent frogs can coast you through it because each individual frog seemed to stick to the same strategy every time, and that means there's always one that gets very near completing the goal before failing. Again, I think this was intentional to help people through. Capturing chocobos is also one that I can see people getting frustrated with, since there's only really one way to tackle them, but that also means they're very easy to blow past with a guide, and they're all short as well. The gallery shooter in Costa del Sol is very easy if you play shooters at all, and again, it's unobtrusive. Similar to a lot of these, it also barely has to be interfaced with for completion, meaning no matter what, you're not expected to spend too much time on it. It also has several different control methods, like a lot of them. Dolphin Racing is in the same boat. Low cost, low reward, and polished enough to not be annoying. I think that's everything besides the best minigame, which is obviously Queen's Blood. I'm gonna say it right now, 
forget Tetra Master, and forget Triple Triad. While I appreciate that Triple Triad can be played with almost any NPC in Final Fantasy VIII, and you can use a bunch of different rules and even spread rules across regions, and while I also appreciate that you can use those cards to reinforce your party for the core combat, it has nothing on the quality and depth of Queen's Blood. I desperately want them to make a free-to-play online standalone Queen's Blood game, like CD Projekt Red did with Gwent. It's that good, and there's a lot of it in Rebirth and a lot of different ways to play it, but thankfully all of it is entirely optional when you're just playing through the game. There's not a whole ton I can say about it specifically that would have tons of meaning, and I'm not that interested in going over every mechanic it offers in this video. Suffice it to say that Queen's Blood is a deep game. It's a game that pushes you to get better really or organically. Every new card you find is rewarding to check out, and the synergies between them are unreal. There are also several different types of decks you can create to tailor your playstyle to your opponent. It comes with a wealth of pre-made decks too for anyone who might want to play the game but doesn't care much for deck building. Once again, it's a mini game that can really push the player hard if they wish, but you can also dominate it by looking up guides if you want. Rebirth has a lot of minigames, and as I said at the top of this section, I was really worried about that, incredibly so, because I'd rather have more combat challenges than suddenly being expected to ride a motorcycle with bad controls or whatever. But they pulled it off here. At worst, the minigames are inoffensive or slightly annoying. And at best, they're wonderful. Most of them are at least engaging and pretty dang good. The minigame tsunami is technically a mixed bag then, but it's mixed much more thoroughly and faithfully favorably than I'd have ever assumed, and the issues aren't because the minigames themselves are bad, and it's not for a lack of effort on the developer's part. They absolutely clearly cared about making this stuff good and generally unobtrusive, which is more than I can say for most minigames in most games, honestly. And with the minigames done, let's clean up a few other quick discussion points before winding down. Firstly, I really hate the yellow paint discussion. For anyone who isn't in the know, lately a lot of people have gotten really upset at hand-holding in games. Sometimes it's warranted, like ally NPCs in some games giving you too many hints too quickly in a puzzle, or outright giving you the solution. And often these don't have toggles to disable them, to make them less frequent, or to make it so that you have to ask for a hint. It's also warranted in some places where the core conceit of the game is trivialized by the handholding. After the demo of Rebirth came out, people got upset at the yellow paint on some handholds for climbing, but their arguments were more reactionary than solid. Firstly, this yellow paint isn't everywhere. Many handholds in the game aren't signposted so clearly, and most aren't signposted in the same way. Secondly, as game graphics have gotten more complex, it has necessitated clearer signposting of interactable elements. That's just reality. Everyone complains about the signposting until a game doesn't have it and then they get far angrier because they missed something that blended into the environment and got stuck for an hour. Just look at how many people loathe the Gungaga area for actually asking you to put effort into finding your way around. Need some yellow paint, guys? But most importantly to Rebirth, this isn't Assassin's Creed. Climbing isn't a core element of gameplay. It's not fleshed out to a great degree, nor is it supposed to be. As such, if it really upsets you so much that it's ruining your experience, you're the problem. Because your expectations for what a game should or shouldn't do is too rigid. Like, this isn't even uncharted. Climbing is rarely used in Rebirth, and when it is, it's stylistic flavoring, not a core element of exploration. So it's very confusing to get this upset at. Same thing with the complaints about the towers and Chadley. It's like people absorb opinions on parts of the game design zeitgeist without understanding why complaints might be leveled at something in the first place. I at least understand why people are a bit annoyed with Chadley himself, but many people are still going way too far with it, and they're kind of missing the forest for the trees. This type of thing is the reason why devs have to work so hard to listen to what players are trying to complain about, not what they're actually saying. Because while Chadley can be involved in helping you find most open world things, he doesn't have to be a part of most of it. Yes, he'll talk to you after accomplishing most open world tasks. These bits can be skipped, but they are there. 
However, you don't have to talk to him or even use the towers to find most everything in the open world. For those that don't know, towers are a common open world trope. You find it, activate it, and it shows you the locations of side content on the map. At their worst, they can completely ruin exploration by plastering the map with the locations of everything you wanted to find yourself. But they aren't inherently bad. The problem is instead when they are made mandatory in order to access that side content. You can see where every tower is as soon as you get into an area in Rebirth, but they don't need to be activated to access any of the other content in said area. So if you don't want the towers to spoil content, be an adult and ignore them. Leave them for last after you've had your fill of legitimate exploration. I promise they can't hurt you unless you let them. Beyond that, Chadley is just a rare materia dispenser, and a side character just like any other who shows up from time to time along your journey for a conversation or two, and who offers VR challenges and combat tutorials. I get it if you find him annoying, but he really doesn't actually have to be interacted with that much. I honestly find it more annoying that his virtual assistant, Mai, has a hard cutoff applied to the voice acting so that her voice constantly clips the mic. I think it was intentional, but it's very very grating for someone like me. I'm a decent amount more negative on one element of Chadley though, which is that he's also tied to unlocking summons. You very much can explore most everything your way at your own pace. To unlock a summon, you have to beat them in Chadley's VR combat challenges, which you had to do a couple of times in Remake. You can make them easier by finding several shrines dedicated to them in the open world, but there's no way to find the summons themselves organically, which was something you could do in Remake, albeit you only found the materia. This is a bit of a shame, and I hope it's changed in the final game. It didn't kill my playthrough or even my interest in the summons. Their fights are still rewarding, they're strategic to use, and I like that you can fight them at several different strength levels, but I do think finding them in the open world would have added a lot, far more than it even could in the original Final Fantasy VII. And this is proven out in games like Final Fantasy XII, which handles finding its summons spectacularly. It isn't as if there's nothing I can see people disliking about Chadley. Rather, it's that I don't think people are complaining about the right things in ways that properly communicate their frustrations. That, and I feel like they're also kind of blaming the game for their own inability to not head straight for towers so that nothing on the map is free to be explored naturally. A few presentational notes are also worth mentioning as we start to wrap up here. The music in Rebirth is fantastic, and while the game is blurry as heck in the 60fps mode, it still looks okay and looks pretty great in the 30fps 4K mode. Textures can sometimes be weirdly low resolution, and pop-in can sometimes be distractingly obvious. I wish they did some sort of level of detail fade-in instead. But the game looks good overall, even if Unreal 4 feels like it's holding the game back a bit. Hopefully they can transition to Unreal 5 for the third part without making Remake and Rebirth look too out of date and without preventing it from having a really solid 60fps mode. The music here is incredible, and there's so much of it. However, I've seen that some random company is apparently claiming some of the tracks left and right, so this time I unfortunately can't risk playing any of it as examples. One of my favorites is surprisingly the Cosmo Canyon area's open world theme, and the team even brought back and remixed the Chocobo Metal song from 13.2, which is fantastic. Fuck the haters. That song is basically identical to most Devil May Cry music, and people love those soundtracks. The lip sync here was largely great, and I didn't notice any real weak spots like I did in Remake, meaning they obviously tightened up the procedural elements to how it functions. My only quote unquote major glitch was here in this bit where Aerith's lay just kept going wild in Costa del Sol. I also wanted to mention that I wonder if maybe the dual demon wall boss was a nod to the exact same gimmick in the new threat mod for the original Final Fantasy VII. If so, that again shows just how much the people working on this game cared. It was a lot. In fact, that's what's most clear to me after all of this, is just how much the people working on this at every artistic and technical level cared about the project. Nobody seems tired or bored or forced into a role. They seem like this is what they want to be doing, and they seem like they're passionate about sharing their take on FF7. 
I understand that there can be a lot of corporate vomit behind remake projects, but I don't think that precludes really passionate artists from caring about them. It doesn't mean there aren't people who would have wanted to make this remake anyway, and who genuinely want to do their own take on it to the best of their ability. That should be respected because that's why the final product shines so brightly. And besides, it's a bit hypocritical for it to suddenly be cool to act like you never wanted FF7 to be remade. Most people did, it's fine. And as I said in my remake video, the original Final Fantasy VII will still be there when all is said and done. I don't think this game has to be perfectly faithful in every way to be good, any more than King Kong or Dracula or Planet of the Apes or Alice in Wonderland or any other older story or experience has to be the exact same thing every time to be good. I want artists to have their own takes that go in wildly different directions. Isn't that why we're trying to fight to limit how long copyright protections can keep working? from the public domain to allow people to take stories we love and make them their own? Humanity was built on storytelling. We've always passed on knowledge and culture and passion and heart through telling and retelling the same stories with augmentations that fit our current world or our current interests or even just our current audience. Part of the beauty of storytelling is that it is malleable. We wouldn't have ever gotten Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z without Journey to the West, you know? We'd have never gotten the Arkham games without being able to let go of the early Batman who shot people with a gun and accept that other versions could exist. John Carpenter's The Thing isn't original, it isn't even the first movie adaptation of the book Who Goes There. The Thing from Another World was, and there was another book adaptation of the idea that came out shortly before John Carpenter's film called The Thing. And yet most likely, whether any one of these versions of the story is good or bad, the one most people have the most love for is John Carpenter's adaptation, while the one that most people would probably say they like the least is the modern film remake that a lot of people consider very safe. We'd have never gotten the Goofy movie or Kingdom Hearts if people had demanded that Goofy and Donald and Mickey all stay the way they were at their very earliest points. We'd have never gotten so many things that we love, whether those be remakes, adaptations, reimagining, spiritual successors, and more, if we didn't let artists take the art of others and do their own thing with it. If we weren't okay with canon only mattering to a point, it doesn't always have to be corporate sellout bullshit. And even when that's the be all and all goal of those funding it, that doesn't mean the artists don't care to make a good piece of art anyway. This is a highly polished, highly finished, artistically rich remake of Final Fantasy VII that cares about the source material, the player, and letting its creators have a voice. It is literally the opposite of the corporate sellout, broken, rushed, lifeless shit people constantly complain about so often, and so many people are searching frantically for every justified and unjustified reason they can to condemn it, all because they have childish chips on their shoulders. And in the process, these types of fans are ruining the experience for both themselves and others, and some of them are legitimately attempting to hurt those that disagree with them in permanent and tangible ways. Well, fuck all that noise. Considering the habits of entertainment these days, there were absolutely legitimate reasons to be worried about them remaking Final Fantasy VII before remakes release. There was reason to worry about the fact that they were splitting it up into multiple games, or that CyberConnect 2 was helming the project early on, or that they were taken off of it so suddenly, or a wealth of other things. But this remake doesn't fall anywhere close to being in the same camp as something like turning The Hobbit into three movies, and I already went over the many reasons a game like this necessitated being bigger for a wealth of very legitimate reasons, arguably unavoidable reasons given fan expectations. Fan expectations that the fans often have no idea the work and hard choices it takes to meet. Nothing related to a property with as much legacy love as Final Fantasy VII can ever be for everyone, and at this point, Remake and Rebirth have undeniably squashed 95% of the more legitimate reasons to feel like this was just going to be a corporate hellscape project, designed for nothing more than clawing pennies into the publisher's bottom line. These worries should be dead and buried. I 
love Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. It is a fantastic game, and it's a special game. If you don't love it, that's okay. But I think whether we like the game or not, we should be willing to acknowledge the sheer level of artistry and passion on display, and show it a bit more respect. Many of us have, including those that don't love it. And I'm glad to stand alongside those people as fans. But there are still those that want to ruin whatever legacy this game can offer at any cost. And I think Rebirth deserves better than that. P.S. Don't hold me to this, but there might be another Rebirth video of a completely different type coming down the pipeline soon. I still have some testing to do, so the idea might not work out. But if it does, I think it should be great. So stay tuned for that. Otherwise, thanks for watching.